for today. Um, so where are my marketing communications people in the house? Okay. Where are my marketing slash development people in the house? Right. Where are the people that kind of do everything? Like a little bit of everything. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. You are definitely my people. So what we're going to talk about today is how we can best leverage some of these digital tools with limited resources and limited time. So we're not going to talk too much about me because Chris just gave me a fabulous introduction. But some things you need to know about me, I am a mom of two. I'm a return Peace Corps volunteer. Um, any return Peace Corps volunteers? Usually when I talk to nonprofits, there are some in the house. Or AmeriCorps uh, volunteers, no. Usually when I'm in DC speaking to nonprofits, there are. Um, probably the most important thing to know about me, though, is that I come from the nonprofit world. You know, we don't just wake up one day and become consultants. Some people do, but unless you've actually lived the life and cleaned the coffee maker and swept the floor after an event and picked up the balloons and done all the great stuff that we do, I don't feel like you can truly understand the nature of nonprofit work. So I have been a development slash marketing director for small and mid-sized organizations. So I completely know what you're going through. I'd love to see some tweets out there today. We've got the hashtag behind me. I'm at Julia C. Social. I'd love to see some social engagement today if you think of anything that you want to share out to the world. I also have a workbook on digital storytelling. I have my official book here with me. I have about 10 copies if you want to come and see me afterwards. Um, but if you want a free copy of the workbook around digital storytelling, make sure you text workbook to 345. Three, four, five. Okay. So the, the title of the talk is Website Versus Social Media. And when I was thinking about how to frame this topic, I thought it's really a battle for scarce resources. So nonprofits are constantly trying to figure out that silver bullet that's going to get them visibility. Like who here feels like they are the best kept secret in their region or in their town? No, no one feels that way. Okay, that's what I feel, that's what I get a lot from my clients. They feel like if only more people heard about us, if only we had more visibility, if only we had more exposure, if only we could get on Ellen, right? If only we could get some famous person to tweet about us, then all of our woes would go away. So where do we put our digital eggs? Do we put them mostly in the website basket? Do we put them in the blog basket? Do we put them in the social media basket. So today I'm here to tell you, you have to do, you have to do it all. <laughs> so there's no, I'm not here to sugarcoat anything, and I'm not here to tell you there's a silver bullet where you can just sort of tweet once a month and you're going to immediately get huge results and you're going to run one Facebook fundraiser and raise millions of dollars. That's not going to happen. So I'm going to talk about some of the benefits and strengths and weaknesses of websites and then some of the benefits, strengths, and weaknesses of social media. And also some of the ways that you can really leverage both of these tools to accomplish your missions, to share the great work that you're doing, and to build a community, because that's what it's about at the end of the day. So web engagement, I don't usually like to share statistics, but web engagement is growing. So what we've been seeing is that Visitors are making donations when they go online, not, certainly not a huge percentage. Now, this could be increased, and I think it's so low because a lot of people, a lot of websites are terrible. So I actually get into a lot of Twitter wars around online fundraising with a lot of the traditional fundraisers out there. If you follow me on Twitter, you probably have seen some of these Twitter wars. Like on Saturday, I'll be sitting on the couch and I'll just be like furiously, you know, typing into my phone and my husband says, are you, are you getting in a Twitter war again? And I'm like, yeah, but it's not about politics, it's about fundraising. That's what I, that's my like passion. So you have probably read studies that say online giving is, what is it now, 7%, 8% of total giving. Okay, great. So that's what fundraisers tend to tell me when they say, well, we shouldn't focus on our website, we shouldn't focus on social, it's only 7% of giving. And to me, I think that's kind of a red herring because that, takes, that number takes into account those billion dollar bequests made to Harvard University. You know, obviously those kinds of 
donations are not being made on Facebook. So I think until we do a true evaluation of smaller dollar donors and smaller gifts, we can't really come up with an accurate number of how much has been raised online. Because like Chris said, it seems to me, since we're all tethered to our phones, that the number should be higher. I don't think it's because people don't want to give. I think it's because all of us are so terrible at making a good experience for people to give online. So I think it's on us. So we're going to talk about how you can optimize your website to make it a better experience. MR Benchmarks is pretty much the standard in the industry, um, the go-to place to get this kind of data. So check out MR Benchmarks. So you know, what are some of the benefits of a website? We all, we all know this, right? You can control the message. You can control the stories. You can control the photos. You can control the narrative on your website. You can take it with you. So WordPress to Squarespace to Wix to Drupal to Joomla to anywhere you want to go. You can easily track your website's effectiveness because you can see how many people are coming. You can see the most popular pages. You can see what's really resonating with your audience. And you can see if all of this social media, all of this promotion that you're doing is working. You can add to it and subtract from it. And then, of course, we can't not talk about Google, right? So <laughs> this is why you need a website. I read a, an article by my friend Chris Strubb. He writes for Forbes, and you should all read his column. He wrote that he'd read a recent report that more nonprofits have a Facebook page than have a website. And to me, that seems crazy because we'll talk about the strengths and weaknesses of social media. There are many of them. But a website is how you get found. So your website is your most important marketing and fundraising piece of collateral. Think about what we do when we hear about something. We Google it. Or we ask Siri. We ask Google Home. We ask Alexa. And I'm going to talk about voice search as well. But having this presence online, that digital identity that Chris talked about, is absolutely vital. I don't feel like I need to convince anyone of that. But just to reiterate that important point. So what are some essential elements of a nonprofit website that is effective? Because you can't just throw up a website and expect everyone to come to the website. You can't just put information on your website and expect everyone to know what you want them to do when you get to your website. So just having that digital identity is not enough. We have to optimize it for our particular audience and our um, goals and our objectives. Every nonprofit website should answer three things. What is the problem that you're solving? What is your solution? And what is your impact? So I've done a lot of reading about persuasion. And the preeminent book on persuasion was actually written by Aristotle. And he wrote a book called The Art of Persuasion in Public Speaking. And he said the three things that you need to convince people and to bring them over to your side and to convince them about your idea are ethos, pathos, and logos. So ethos means your credibility and your, your establishing credibility and trust. That's why Chris says things, great things about me, like I'm one of the 25 IT influencers, that's why we write books, that's why we check how many followers we have on Instagram and Twitter. That's ethos, that's credibility, establishing that you're a credible source of information. Logos tells me that there's a problem and there's something I need to be paying attention to. So yes, you solve the issue, you work on homelessness. Is that something I should care about? You can't assume that everyone understands the issue as much as you do and feels as passionately about it as you do. And then eth um, ethos, pathos, logos. Pathos is the emotional connection. That's where storytelling comes in. If you want people to take an action, you are never going to get them from A to Z without that emotional connection. And that's where impact comes in. So problem, solution, impact. And I'm going to show you some examples. Buildon.org. Their website looks like this. I just took these screenshots a couple of weeks ago. Problem. Bonus points if you can get us all on the same page right off the bat. Education is a basic human right, right? Yes. If I'm looking at buildon.org's website, I most likely agree with that statement. So what's the statement that you can make on your website that people will immediately say, yes, yes, I'm, right, I'm here, I'm at the right place? 
Then the problem. What's the problem that you're solving? What's your solution? So this is all one page, because we know websites now, we scroll. It doesn't have to all be above the fold. Most websites are accessed via mobile devices, so it doesn't need to be mobile accessible. But what is the solution that you offer? So you have to talk about the problem first, because if you don't have me on board with the why, I'm not going to get on board with the how. I'm not going to care about the how. If, I do, if I'm not invested in the why, I will never be invested in the how. So it's very important to establish the why first. Then you establish what you do, and then you share your impact. It's OK to share data. I know that I talk a lot about storytelling. I write a lot about storytelling. It's OK to share data that establishes this impact, but it's incredibly more impactful to share stories. So showing and not telling often works better. But Build On does a great job. This is Embrace. Each year, more than 1 million babies die on their birthday. So that kind of establishes right off the bat, is this something that you care about? Is this an issue that you think is a problem? And if you do, then you're immediately grabbed. Your attention is peaked. You want to learn more. And you say, this is a problem. How can I solve it? And then Embrace talks about their solution, their unique solution that they've come up with. And this is going to solve the problem that you care about. We have to understand that people do not give to our organizations. They give to solve a problem. So if your organization, if your whole website is focused on how great your organization is and how great all the things you do are, but it doesn't talk about the problem, then it's not going to convert people into donors, into supporters. Then, of course, storytelling. At the very end, what's the impact of your solution? How can I know that to trust you? How do I know you're a good steward of my funds? OK, another, um, this is Pencils of Promise. Why build schools? What's the problem? Why do I care? We, they even go as far as to really spell it out. We have a solution, and it works. We have a solution, and it works. I know a lot of you are probably working on issues that are a little bit more complex. Maybe you're working not in human services. You're working in an academic environment. You're working in research. And it's really hard to translate what you do into impact. But we have to do a better job. So I worked as a development and marketing director at a domestic violence shelter. and. Doing this exercise is really challenging because we know what we do. We help women and children get out of abusive situations. We provide support. We provide transitional housing. We link them up with services. We save lives. We know what we do. But it's really, really hard to describe the overall impact. But we do have to get better at it. And then asking people to imagine if this was something that they were dealing with. So when you're doing storytelling on your website or on social media, trying to bring people into the problem, bring people into the solution, ask them if they can imagine what it might feel like, and then sharing data about your impact. So we could solve all the website problems of the world if all nonprofit websites just focused on problem, solution, and impact. We get so bogged down in all of the data and reports and information and PDFs that we need to share. But really, that's why people come. That's why people come to you. The second element is that you have to have an email sign up. So I love social media. I talk a lot about it. But the reality of social media is what is your Facebook page reach? Does anyone know the average reach of like a Facebook page post? Do they want to share what you, how many, what percentage of your fans on Facebook do you think you reach with a post? 2%. 2%. 3% if you're not paying to reach more people. I would hope that your email open rate is higher than 2%. <laughs> you should all know your email open rate, by the way. And you should all know your Facebook reach rate. But I would really hope your open rate is higher than 2%. If it's not, come talk to me. We will talk. But I think that we need to start focusing our efforts much more on building our email list. Because email crosses demographics, crosses generations. And it's still a little bit more of an intimate experience than social media. So inviting people when they come to your website. Everybody needs a pop-up. 
or something on the bottom, not just a little tiny font, 10 point font up in the bottom top right that says sign up for our email list. Add impact to your inbox. That's so much more inspiring than sign up for an email list. Let's end malaria. Don't miss any important updates in our fight to end malaria. I'd so much rather end malaria than sign up for another email list. So think about the wording you're using. This is wonderful because this offers value. They're giving you two ways to help. And that can all be automated. You can set that up to send an automated email out and send it right away when they sign up. Two ways to help. Be the first to know. So think about how we experience FOMO, right? The fear of missing out. We don't want to miss out. We don't want to miss an update. We want to know what's going on with this problem that we care about. OK, also telling stories. This is another essential element. Creating that pathos, creating that emotional connection, and showcasing impact. You can tell stories in the words of the people that you serve talking about their transformation. You can share videos. You can share photos. You can share donor spotlights, volunteer spotlights, staff spotlights. Bring me behind the scenes and explain to me not only why the problem is important, but why I need to care about the people that are experiencing this problem and the transformational impact that you make. This is the Pine Street Inn in Boston, one of my favorite organizations. And they focus on very positive storytelling. So the stories that you tell, they don't have to all be pulling heartstrings. They don't have to be doom and gloom. They don't have to necessarily be wrapped up in a bow. They just need to be interesting. You need to have a relatable character. You need to have a conflict. You need to have stakes. You need to tell me how people are feeling. So rather than telling me a recounting of things that happened, tell me how it made someone feel. Tell me what it sounded like, what it smelled like, what it felt like. Use all five senses. So what we normally do on our websites is we say, you know, Christine was tired and cold. She came to the Pine Street Inn. She got some help, and now she's good. That's not a story. That's an essay. Where are the stakes? What's getting me interested? How, you know, how did she feel? So think about reframing stories. I love this. I so love this meme. So we also need to think about our donation processes, right? So people come to me all the time, and they say, no one's donating on our website. And I try to donate. And I have to go to the home page, find the donate button. And then sometimes it doesn't even say donate. It says get involved. Then I have to go to get involved, click down like a, a long line of links, and then click the donate button. And then the donate button sends me to this form where I have to fill out basically my entire life and like provide a tax return and like a birth certificate to, to make a donation. And they've already completely lost me. So think about how you can make it more of a seamless experience. People are used to seamless experiences, right? Think about Amazon. I get frustrated if Amazon doesn't know immediately what I want. I get annoyed. I'm like, God, I shopped so much on Amazon. I need to just like type in a couple of keywords. You need to tell me what I, what I want. We are used to seamless experiences, seamless checkout experiences, and nonprofits need to do a better job. We need to do a better job at being where our donors are and giving them every opportunity to donate whether that's Venmo, whether that's PayPal, whether that's Facebook, we'll talk a little bit about Facebook, whether that is text to give, we need to reach our donors where they are. And this is why I think online giving is so low, because we don't really offer it. We don't promote it. We don't have a great experience with it. So of course donors are going to be much more likely to give another way or not give at all. And small dollar donors are disappearing. The latest fundraising effectiveness project found that don donations and donors that give under $250 are down 7% this year. Smaller dollar donors are, are leaving, the bread and butter donors that we count on. And of course, the benefit of a website is being found. It's being found. So sure, if you have a LinkedIn page, you have a Facebook page and Twitter, if I Google you, I can find those pages. But then what's going to happen is I'll go to Facebook. Maybe I'll like your page, but then I'll immediately get distracted with 75 notifications and other things. Your website is your real, you're really able to control the narrative and control people's attention on your website. 
and of course voice search, you can make a donation via Google Assistant. You can say to Alexa, and I don't want to do it because of people that are live streaming. <laughs> Have you ever listened to a podcast and someone says, OK, Alexa, and then your house freaks out um, because all the Alexas. I have Google Home, personally. But when you ask Alexa or Google Home, or I don't know if it works for Siri. I'm assuming it does. I don't know if anyone has Cortana. That's the Microsoft one. I don't think anyone has that. So you can ask, donate to charity. And if you have Google Pay set up, you can automatically make a donation right there. If you don't have a website, this is not going to be able to happen for you. And this is the, these are the trends that we as marketers and fundraisers need to be paying attention to. We need to have our fingers on the pulse of this. We need to know what our donors are doing. This is how we're finding out news. This is how we're finding things out. One way to do this is to make sure you claim your business listing on Google. It's totally free. If you have an office, if you have a brick and mortar, of course, like when I worked at the domestic violence shelter, we weren't able to do this. We didn't want to reveal our location. But for those of you that can, this is incredibly important. This is how you're going to be found. Google is now pretty much removing URLs from search. And they're just going to start doing these little previews. And if you don't have all of your information optimized in Google, you're going to be less likely to be found when people are searching for you. And year end's coming up, Giving Tuesday's coming up. Make sure that you're optimized for voice search and for SEO, which is a whole other conversation and a perfect science that I'm not an expert in SEO. All I know is there are tiny little tweaks and things that you can do to make your website be found. Your website should function like an employee. You need a job description. You need performance benchmarks. And you need regular evaluations. Don't spend $10,000 on a website if you don't know what you want it to do. Then evaluate it every three months. Is it meeting our expectations? Are we getting online donations? Are we getting membership inquiries? Are we getting volunteer inquiries? Are we getting email signups? What is it that we want people to do when we go to the website? What is the one thing, the two things? And then evaluate it every three months and take a look at how it's performing and make some tweaks. So your website, think of how much time and money you invest in it, should be treated like an employee. Okay, so that's it for websites. Um, we're gonna talk now about social media. So I don't think the two are mutually exclusive. I see the digital world as a big ecosystem. Of course, we have everything in our pocket, like Chris was saying, our phones. Not only have our phones transformed the way that humans behave, Social media platforms are a revolution in communication on par with the printing press. Think about how social media has completely changed the way humans interact, the way that we discover information, the way that we identify ourselves, the way that we express our worldviews, express what we stand for, express our values, the way that we connect with people, the way that we talk to people. I mean, I just think last night, I was thinking, oh, I've really been offline. I've been traveling. I've been so busy. I haven't been answering my phone and my text messages. I'm just going to go on Facebook, look up a bunch of my friends, and just like their posts and comments so they know I'm alive, so they know I'm thinking about them, so they know that you know, they're important to me. And even though I can't always be fully responsive, um, that I am thinking of them. So it's just com a complete revolution. It's not a to-do item. It's not a shiny new tool. I hate the term shiny new tool. We need to stop using that. It just is like code for something we don't understand. right? And I can't stand the term shiny new tool. So we need to all stop using that. This is a revolution in communication. It's not a shiny new tool. And people are not leaving social media in droves. Yes, certain sites become more popular and rise up. Certain sites kind of die away. Think about Friendster. Think about MySpace. Um, think about the rise of TikTok now. That's one of the most popular ones. But the majority of people that are online do have at least one social media account. YouTube in America is the most popular uh, with Facebook. This is the Pew Research Center. If you want to find fantastic demographic data uh, across, usually it's just in the United States, they do some international studies around each platform around each particular generation and around behavior. 
So definitely behavior has changed. We're spending less time, and by less time I mean like one minute a day less, as opposed to last year. We are spending less time on it. We're being a little bit more focused when we go on it. And the only platform that's really growing in leaps and bounds is Instagram. Everything else is sort of plateaued. That doesn't mean people are not on it, and that doesn't mean people are not using it. It just means we occasionally need to pay attention. We can't get too comfortable. We can't say, oh, we have a Facebook page. We're good. We need to constantly be evaluating what we're doing, figuring out where our audience is and what we, what we could best benefit from. So the delete Facebook movement, you know, it was kind of a thing, I guess, but it didn't, no one deleted their Facebook account. We all like to say you know, that we're going to delete our Facebook account, and we never do. We, maybe some of us wish that we could, but we, we don't. And then don't just write it off and say our donors are not there. This is by far one of the biggest excuses that I hear from nonprofits. Our donors are not there. Are your donors human? Like, are they online? Are they in the United States? Are some of them in the United States or in the UK? I mean, they're on social media. Whether They might not be on it all day, and they might not be on more than one site. We need to stop thinking that we are our donors. We are not our donors, OK? Our donors are different people. Like, what resonates with us and what we like, like just because we hate Twitter does not mean that our audience hates Twitter. And this is what I see all the time in communications and in storytelling. Well, I don't really feel comfortable being emotional and writing an emotional appeal to my donors. Well, guess what? That's what they like and that's what they want. So you have to really think about meeting your donors where they are, or your members or your supporters um, where they are. Not only that, social media, not only are people on there, there is some benefit for organizations and nonprofits. People use <coughs> social media to talk about things they care about, to establish their worldview, and to establish their identity. If I'm going to share something on social, it's because it represents who I am. I'm not going to share something. I might share something I don't believe in, but I'm going to tell you why I don't believe in it. Or I'm going to tell you why I believe in it, why this is part of my worldview. Social media influences people to make donations. So it actually is an influential piece of the puzzle, piece of the communications puzzle. So this is a Global Trends and Giving Report. Um, they just released the 2019 version. So if you go to givingreport.ngo, you can find the Global Trends and Giving Report. It's actually really, really interesting. And it talks a lot about um, offline as well as online giving. We also can't deny the fact that Facebook fundraisers are forced to be reckoned with. So who here has created a Facebook fundraiser, like raised money on their birthday? OK, who here has donated to a Facebook fundraiser? OK. And if you haven't, raise your hand. Who here has seen a Facebook fundraiser come through their feed? Right? OK, so whether or not you created one or donated to one, you've seen one. Facebook released a report that said, since the inception of charitable giving tools, They've raised $2 billion, not Facebook, us, people, our donors, have raised $2 billion on the platform from 45 million donors. And of those donors surveyed, 88% plan on giving via Facebook again in the next year. Now, I don't know what your donor retention rate is, but it's not 88%. If it is 88%, you need to be on the stage talking about what you do, because that's amazing. The average nonprofit, their donor retention rate, that is who gives, year, who gives a second gift, is 45%. 45%. So we are doing a terrible job of retaining our donors, and that is a subject for a whole other talk. But what I'm trying to say is that Facebook and tools like it, YouTube has a suite of charitable giving tools that I bet a lot of you didn't know exist. They're rolling out fundraisers, the same as Facebook. It's all in beta right now. Um, go to make sure you go to Google for nonprofits, sign up so that when this, the tools roll out, you'll have access to them. But it, it also represents a revolution in peer-to-peer -peer fundraising because it's accessible. OK, and I'm getting too wordy. All right, so <laughs> Facebook fundraisers, whether you love them or hate them, they're, they're a force to be reckoned with. We have to understand 
if it's a benefit for our organization or not, people are going to use them whether we like it or not. Also, we do need to know we don't have control over these channels. This is the drawback. If you do Facebook fundraisers, you already know this. You don't get the donor data, right? You don't get the donor data. You get the money, and I say 20 bucks is 20 bucks. That's what I think. You get the money, but you don't get the data. Also, any of these tools could you know, throw the rug out from under us at any moment, as we know they often do. So we don't have control over them. People are also not on there necessarily to find us. They're on there to connect with their friends and family. They're on there to connect with colleagues. But where we can kind of fit in is if we become part of their identity, if we become part of their, we create a shared identity with our donors and with our community, then they're much more likely to spread the word about us because it's not a hassle. Okay, so we'll go quickly through the five elements. I was getting too wordy here. I wanna make sure that we have time for questions. Um, but we'll go through the five elements and then if we have questions at the end, we're happy to, we're happy to take them. So the number one element that I've found is that you need to cre treat each channel like its own country, with its own rule of law, its own language, its own etiquette. You cannot simply spray out your message on every channel. You can repurpose something if you have a great story or a great video, certainly you can share it, but you need to mold it for each channel and you need to have a strategy for each channel. Now I'm not saying you have to be on each channel, Maybe you only want to be on one or two, but you have to have a dedicated strategy for each of them. Take a look at what the IRS does. Who would have thought that I would be mentioning the IRS in a social media talk? But if you look at the way they use social media, they use each channel very strategically for a very specific purpose to reach a very specific audience. So follow them on Instagram or see what they're doing, see what they're doing on Facebook, see what they're doing on Twitter, and you'll see it's very targeted and very specific and very strategic. Jump on hashtags and things that are trending. Today's World Mental Health Awareness Day, right? There's always a cause and awareness day that you can jump on, that you can leverage for your organization. What are people talking about? This is where we fall flat. We don't share relevant content. We just share boring stuff or stuff that's relevant to us. What's relevant to our audience? What are they interested in? This is the TSA, and I bet you didn't think I'd be sharing the TSA. I have to read this caption because it's really funny. This is the TSA on Instagram. Are we cool? We like to think we're cool. We want you to have a pleasant experience at the airport and arrive safely at your destination. But getting caught while trying to fly with marijuana or cannabis-infused products can really harsh or mellow. And then they wrote, let us be blunt. TSA officers do not search for marijuana or other illegal drugs. So they have a clear voice, and they're a little bit cheeky, and they know that they deal with boring, dry material, so they spice it up a little bit. So I really recommend following them on Instagram especially. Think about what people are searching for and what your most frequently asked questions are. This campaign is an organization that constantly received questions from parents that said, I've just been told by my doctor I'm going to have a baby with Down syndrome. What is it like? That was their most frequently asked question. So they created a series of videos based on that. So they could not only be found in YouTube, but so that they could address this when their donors, their members, their supporters came to them and asked this question. Sharing information that's actually helpful and useful and shareable, like the Humane Society. What's going on right now as dangerous weather sweeps across the country? Think about what people are talking about. Think about what's timely and relevant. Really know your audience. This is Rhodes Scholar, one of my former clients, and we worked really hard to try to figure out who they're speaking to on social media. Who do they want to reach? And we call her the funky grandma. And then we always think about the kind of content that we're creating. Would she like it? Yes, we'll post it. Would she not like it? We probably won't post it. Eye-catching visuals. I bet that all caught all of your eyes. This is one of my absolute favorite campaigns, Give Childhood marriage the finger. Eye-catching visuals. We have to be more provocative. We have to get out of our comfort zone. We have to create that emotional connection and be not, we can't be afraid to really share what's going on, to tell people, this is the problem. This is what's happening. All of you need to pay attention and we need to get on board and we need to solve this. Think about how you can elicit a reaction 
or get someone to take action. Engagement is the name of the game on social media. If you post something and everyone says, oh, that's great, that's nice, just scrolls right past it, Facebook is going to think that you're irrelevant. And then video I'm not going to actually talk about because we have Brian Fanzo coming up. He's going to do an incredible presentation on video. But let's get out of our comfort zone, right? Let's start going live. Let's start answering questions. You can add the donate button on your live video. Let's just start reaching our donors where they are, giving them what they want, and creating relevant content, whether it's on our website, whether it's on social media, that's going to create that shared identity with people, and that's really going to help them know who we are, know why to care, and know what to do next. So with that, I think we will do some Q&A. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Oh, we're going to sit down? Take a seat. So we were, we've got 10 minutes for Q&A. And this is an open, inclusive discussion. So we're really wanting to stimulate any questions that you have relating to this presentation, but also in the broader context of websites and social media and engaging fans. Yes. That's the microphone. <laughs> Just for our live viewers. OK. Um, first of all, thank you. And um, I think a couple things. I just want to make a comment that I absolutely, um, I actually didn't think about the fact that marketing within each social media channel is extremely important. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about starting a nonprofit um, and a small nonprofit. And it's, um, and it's based on um, a feeding underserved um, children in, um, in the public school system. And so it, it, I, can, I can imagine having to really target different communities. And so I, it, was, it was actually very enlightening. So thank you. But, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but my, my question to you is, where can we find resources to okay. connect with the audiences when it comes to like Mental Health Day? Right, because you were talking about the connection, right? Because mm. it can't just be about us. Yes. So with, you know, how, do, how do we do that? Well, I Where would we talk it? to your, your board. Do you have a board? Not yet. I mean, literally, okay. I'm just thinking about that. But I'm thinking about other people. Maybe a group are. of people that you know, even if it's your friends and family, mm -hmm. that care about the same things that you care about, care about this issue, and write down like 10 different things that they care about involved with the issue. And then I would use Twitter. I would use um, YouTube, because they're both search engines. Really, that's how people use them based around keywords. Um, there's also a list, if you Google uh, cause and awareness days, I know nonprofit Tech for Good, um, which is NP Tech for Good, I believe, .com, but we just Google it, right? We just Google everything, ask Siri about it. Um, they publish cause and awareness days. And then just look on Twitter, you'll see. Uh, it's World Pizza Day, I think yesterday was it's a beer day, you know, it's emoji day, it's this day, it's that day. Um, and think about, you don't have to jump on everything, but think about what your audience is searching on and what's relevant to them. So in some cases, you, you may be your audience. You know, you might be the avatar that you're trying to reach. But in other cases, talk to the people that you're trying to reach and, and find out what they're searching on and what they're interested in. Okay, thank you. I have one oh. more question, and my voice is very loud. Okay. So, Database of just nonprofits, like just oh. nonprofits. <coughs> I don't know. No, I mean I would check GuideStar, which is got candid now, um, but there isn't anywhere that anyone can idealist. idealist but I, I don't know if the government has a database of five hundred one c threes. But the problem is that there's so many organizations that are, you know, five hundred one c fours, five hundred one c threes. But I would, by the way, right, I would check Idealist and GuideStar to start. Hi. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, do you have an example of someone that used storytelling and had an impact uh, that, that actually, um, you talked about how you can do it, but is, are there any examples of someone 
or an organization that actually did it and improved their donation situation. Now, I, pr I promise you I'm not trying to sell you my book, but my book is full filled. That's like the entire book is examples of organizations either that I've worked with or that I've seen that do One effective example, storytelling. example, for example, would Well, be a lot of the examples on the slides, like the Pine Street Inn, um, Rosie's Place, Feeding America, if you're thinking about, uh, I'm just thinking of the topic of feeding children throughout the school year when they don't have access to free lunch and free breakfast. Um, Buildon.org. Another great example is the Malala Fund. They do fantastic storytelling and raise a ton of money on Instagram in particular um, and on Facebook. So I'm happy to give you a list. Yeah. So the, let's use the yeah. um, feed. The, I, I like talking about food. Sure. So uh, what was the strategy and what, what was it that made them impactful? The stories. The stories had all of those elements. They talked about the problem, they talked about the solution, and they talked about the impact. So for Malala, she used to be the face of the organization. Now she talks to a lot of girls that have gone and gotten an education and just interviewing them and talking to them about what their life was like before, what's their life like now, what are their hopes and dreams for the future? So it, when I talk about storytelling, it doesn't necessarily have to be like the hero's journey that we're so used to, you know, Luke Skywalker <laughs> or Katniss in The Hunger Games or, you know, um, Frodo or something. It doesn't have to be like um, the monomyth, like this happened, this happened, this happened. It can really just be an anecdote. And, you know, especially on social media, I think that really works. Just a little bit about how they felt before, how they feel now, and where are they going, what's their vision for the future. Um, but it really it depends on the organization, but it can really just be like a little anecdote. And it's, there's two ways to do it. So one, if you're really using it to fundraise, then you do have to pull the heartstrings a little bit and get me to really, really be invested in care. But if you're trying to just build community, you're thanking your donors, you're you know, raising awareness, you're staying top of mind, that's when you can really use those little anecdotes, those kind of in the moment, behind the scenes anecdotes. Does it help? Hi, my name is Lisa Fuhr. I'm uh, from uh, PIR board. Um, I have a question regarding uh, social media and the negative responses you get. What is yes. your uh, experience? Should you uh, respond to it or let it die in silence or because sometimes if you respond you actually accelerate a more stream of, of negativity. Mm -hmm. The most important thing you can do is have a policy of what is tolerated and what is not tolerated. So put it on your website and then you can link to it from your social media pages and as long as you're not arbitrary, as long as you say this harassment is not tolerated, bigotry, obscenity, racism, misogyny, whatever it is. Um, I have some sample policies I can email you. As long as you're not arbitrary about what is accepted, then you can delete them. If they're violating your clearly stated policy. If they're expressing an opinion that you don't like and they're not violating your policy, then you do have to engage with them, but you can try to take them offline. So I worked for um, a mayor of a local city where I lived, and he was terrified of social media because of this exact because he was thinking it's just going to be all people complaining about the city and the traffic. What I found is people just want to be heard. And often if you say, that's really frustrating, or I'm really sorry that happened, can you email me over here? And you just take it offline. Um, and then, of course, if they continue to go and they're violating your policies, you can say, I'm really sorry you violated my policy. We have a no, you know, let's cross the line and we have to delete you. But the thing with social media is that these conversations are going to happen whether or not you're involved. So I like, to, I like for us to be involved and help to control the narrative and help control the information and give people the correct information if they have misinformation. But yeah, I w if someone's being just a troll, then as long as you have a policy around that, you can delete them. Any uh, final questions? We got room for one more. Hi, my name is uh, Beth. I also actually work for uh, .org. 
But I think that this was incredibly helpful and really um, insightful. I think will be helpful for a lot of smaller nonprofits. To that, I, you talk a lot about meeting your audience where they live and identifying that person that you're talking about, the funky grandma or whomever that may be. Um, for those smaller nonprofits where everyone is doing everything or one person is doing everything, what are some good tips for those folks getting off the ground um, if, they're, if they don't feel like their social media outreach is landing? Um, what can they do to, to, to tweak it to figure out who their audience is? The thing with social media is that it's really a marathon and not a sprint. I mean, it's, you have to show up consistently for your audience and you have to pick one or two channels that you are committed to and pick a consistent like cadence to post. So what I see happen all the time is that small nonprofits especially, they say, okay, we're gonna post on Instagram twice a week and then they get busy and then they leave it and then they try to come back to it and then they leave it again. So figure out what is the realistic schedule you can stick to even if it's one platform and stick to it and stick to it and stick to it and then the number two piece of advice I would give is talk to your donors, talk to your members, the people that love you and support you. Ask them, what do you want to hear more from us? What are some of the knowledge gaps you might have? What, is, what are some helpful resources and information that we can share with you around the problem? Because we get so wrapped, we were sold a bill of goods around social media, right? We were, set, we were sold like, we just set up accounts and all of a sudden the money is going to roll in and it's going to be promotional and it's a billboard but it's actually really a two-way street and it's about building community so if you're talking to your audience of everything you're you're doing you're running it through the filter of would my donor like this or would my audience member like this would this respond with them if you're running it through that filter and you're doing it consistently it might be incremental growth but you, you should be getting better results than you're getting so I hope that helps. It's definitely, it's simple, but it's not, it's not easy to do. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah and uh, you. will you be around for a little bit longer today? Yes, I'll be around all day. So I'm happy to 